July 29th Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible Nehemiah Chapter 13 of the Old Testament On that day the Book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people. They found written in it that no Ammonite or Moabite may ever enter the assembly of God, for they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but instead had hired Balaam to curse them. Our God, however, turned the curse into blessing. When they heard the law, they removed from Israel all who were of mixed ancestry. But prior to this time, Eliashib, the priest, a relative of Tobiah, had been appointed over the storerooms of the temple of our God. He made for himself a large storeroom where previously they had been keeping the grain offering, the incense, and the vessels, along with the tithes of the grain, the new wine, and the olive oil as commanded for the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the offering for the priest. During all this time I was not in Jerusalem, for in the thirty-second year of King Artaxerxes of Babylon I had gone back to the king. After some time I had requested leave of the king, and I returned to Jerusalem. Then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah by supplying him with a storeroom in the courts of the temple of God. I was very upset and I threw all of Tobiah's household possessions out of the storeroom. Then I gave instructions that the storeroom should be purified and I brought back the equipment of the temple of God, along with the grain offering and the incense. I also discovered that the grain offerings for the Levites had not been provided, and that as a result the Levites and the singers who performed this work had all gone off to their fields. So I registered a complaint with the leaders asking, Why is the temple of God neglected? Then I gathered them and reassigned them to their positions. Then all of Judah brought the tithe of the grain, the new wine, and the olive oil to the storerooms, I gave instructions that Shalemiah, the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a certain Levite named Pideah be put in charge of the storerooms, and that Hanan, son of Zachar, the son of Mattaniah, be their assistant, for they were regarded as trustworthy. It was then their responsibility to oversee the distribution to their colleagues. Please remember me for this, O my God, and do not wipe out the kindness that I have done for the temple of my God and for its services. In those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath, bringing in heaps of grain and loading them onto donkeys, along with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads, and bringing them to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So I warned them on the day that they sold these provisions. The people from Tyre who lived there were bringing fish and all kinds of merchandise and were selling it on the Sabbath to the people of Judah, and in Jerusalem of all places. So I registered a complaint with the nobles of Judah, saying to them, What is this evil thing that you are doing, profaning the Sabbath day? Isn't this the way your ancestors acted, causing our God to bring on them and on this city all this misfortune? And now you are causing even more wrath on Israel, profaning the Sabbath like this. When the evening shadows begin to fall on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be closed. I further directed that they were not to be opened until after the Sabbath. I positioned some of my young men at the gate so that no load could enter on the Sabbath day. The traders and sellers of all kinds of merchandise spent the night outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and said, Why do you spend the night by the wall? If you repeat this, I will forcibly remove you. From that time on, they did not show up on the Sabbath. Then I directed the Levites to purify themselves and come and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. For this, please remember me, O my God, and have pity on me in keeping with your great love. Also in those days I saw the men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples mentioned and were unable to speak the language of Judah. So I entered a complaint with them. I called down a curse on them, and I struck some of the men and pulled out their hair. I had them swear by God, saying, You will not marry off your daughters to their sons, and you will not take any of their daughters as wives for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of things like these that King Solomon of Israel sinned? 
Among the many nations there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. But the foreign wives made even him sin. Should we then, in your case, hear that you do all this great evil, thereby being unfaithful to our God, by marrying foreign wives? Now one of the sons of Joiada, son of Eliashib the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. So I banished him from my sight. Please remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood, the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. So I purified them of everything foreign, and I assigned specific duties to the priest and the Levites. I also provided for the wood offering at the appointed times and also for the first fruits. Please remember me for good, O my God. God, in, in this chapter, Nehemiah is talking about King Solomon. And we know that even though he was a very wealthy king and a very wise king, and you gave him, you gave him those things, he still at the end of his life was surrounded by other religions and other gods and idols and, and wives who had turned his fancy towards those idols. And Nehemiah is talking about how taking out those opportunities to sin gives them a better chance to be faithful to you. Now, a lot of times we think that these things don't apply to us. They happened so long ago. Um, at least here in the United States, we don't have kings anymore. Uh, our kings, for the most part, <laughs> that, are, that are in the world uh, have one wife, not multiple wives. Um, we don't think that we... Are worshiping idols anymore which couldn't be further from the furthest from the truth but I think about what Nehemiah is saying and and how he's trying so hard to go by the letter of the law and the spirit of the law and get back to exactly the commandments that you gave Moses and the law that you gave Moses and this whole part about not having uh, certain people around because they naturally were worshiping their gods, their idols, and they would have that effect upon um, this new remnant that had come back and is now setting up the temple in the correct way and worshiping in the correct way and trying to do everything right. But even though we think we have nothing in common with those, we do. Because how many things do we surround our lives with that cause us to sin or pretend, potentially tempt us to sin? TV would be one, movies would be one, magazines we read, um, newspapers, things that we participate with online. And I'm not talking uh, pure, pure lustful things like porn. I'm talking about just some of the things that show up in our, our feed on Facebook or our Twitter feed, even on Pinterest. Anything that isn't pure and lovely and of you, God, that allows us to grow more in you are things that we should really work on removing from our lives. And I probably just scared most of the people <laughs> listening to this video. Um, and even, even me, I, I struggle with that. Um, I made the decision last year to completely get rid of my TV thought that was going to be a really hard decision. It turned out to be a easier decision than what I thought. Um, also saved me a ton of money and has freed up way more time than I thought I was spending watching TV. But, but just taking an assessment of just the TV alone and how much crap was coming into my life as I would veg out in front of the TV. Same exact type of thing that Nehemiah is trying to get out in front of them. Get out from right in front of you any sort of temptation that can lead you away from what God wants you to be doing. I just use TV as an example because that's one of my gods I got rid of. I still have a lot to work on. <laughs> so God, I just come before you and, and ask you to show us our gods. We have gar gods of comfort. We have gods of, of financial success. We choose idols that have to do with titles. Uh, where we live, what we drive, who our friends are. Um, we have idols in the sense of media. It's probably one of our, our worst ones. And media slash internet, I would say. 
God, just like Nehemiah, allow us to evaluate what our lives look like and the pieces of those temptations that we honestly think that we can ward off, those temptations that not even the wisest man could deal with. And he succumbed at at the end of his life to all of these other religions and idols and gods through through his multiple wives. God, allow us to search our lives. And then as we find these things that aren't of you, that are common, that are worldly, allow us to figure out how to get rid of them. And, and it may be as simple or as difficult as calling the cable company and canceling your cable or not picking up that magazine as you go through the checkout line or not going to that particular movie but choosing a, a more wholesome <laughs> movie. There's all these things that we could be making better choices of. You know, I think sometimes when I go to the movies and it's just sheer entertainment and veg out for a couple hours for me, that's the same amount of time I could spend going out to dinner with somebody and talking to them and listening to them, being a friend to them, loving them, which is exactly what you called us to do. God, help us to make better choices. Allow us to make choices to turn away from our idols and not just turn away from them, but to remove them from our lives so that there's not a temptation to go back to them or turn to them and find comfort and affection and love that is never fulfilling in those particular idols, but instead allow our lives to be free to connect to you, to build a relationship with you. This will help us to keep on track We have enough temptations in this world as it is. Intentionally putting temptation in our lives in the form of our idols is just asking for it, just like King Solomon did. God, I thank you very much for your word today. It is very powerful and allow us to always realize that even though these words were written thousands and thousands of years ago, that they are still very crucially beneficial to us and actually have to do with how we seek you and the relationship we have with you. In your son's name I pray, amen.